The next point I wanted to bring up is the Ethics Code 1.07, Cultural Responsiveness and Diversity. In this one it says, behavior analysts actively engage in professional development activities to acquire knowledge and skills related to cultural responsiveness and diversity. They evaluate their own biases and ability to address the needs of individuals with diverse backgrounds, e.g. age, disability, ethnicity, gender expression or identity, immigration status, marital or relationship status, national origin, race, religion, sexual orientation, socio and socioeconomic status. Behavior analysts also evaluate biases of their supervisees and trainees, as well as their supervisors and trainees' ability to address the needs of individuals with these diverse needs and backgrounds. This one I'm passionate about. Diversity and inclusion is something that is very, very important to me, so I was happy to see that this one actually wasn't added. Updated, I think is a way to put it. And what I'm happy to see is that the access to training for this increase, because first, I, you know, um, looking through the crosswalk, I noticed it and was like, okay, so here we have to be experts in yet again something else. How do we do this? <laughs> you know, what's, what's the easy way to kind of like get this information if, if it's going to be our responsibility to disseminate it to our supervisees and to our trainees? But I have to say, looking through the past conferences that even I've been to, there have been so many great topics related to cultural competence and diversity, um, even ones that are upcoming up. So this is something that don't be like me and initially get overwhelmed, that there's no way that you're gonna be able to support <laughs> your supervisees and your trainees. There is information available. If you just kind of step back and think of your own clinical practice, I'm sure you're doing a lot of these things, but might not be coding it as cultural responsiveness and diversity. So the first point I want to open up for discussion is access to training. What's your guys' comfort level with this? That we have to not only evaluate our own biases, but that of the our supervisors and our trainees. So what's everyone's comfort level with that? I think I'm medium comfort level. <laughs> like I don't want to say that I'm anywhere near an expert, but I think when topics come up, I'm able to bring it up because if it's somebody who you're already training, it's somebody who hopefully they're seeing you as an expert. Pretty recently, maybe like two weeks ago, I was doing an intake, a brand new BC, this is the first intake that she did, and two things came up. One of them, like on purpose, like I overheard the learner referring to her parents, but on purpose in front of trainee, I asked, how does she refer to you guys? I already knew, I already wrote it down. <laughs> but I had to take back and like, you know what, those are the things that I'm automatically doing because I've been in the field for a long time. As a new BC, she might not know to do that. So I made it a point, that's a very simple question to ask. It's not an offensive question. It's just, you want to make sure that if we're moving forward to do any kind of like follow directions to go to somebody, receptive ID or labeling, answer personal information question, what's your blank's name? You know what I mean? You want to make sure that whether you're using the term, you know, mommy, mommy, me, ama, you know, amu, whatever it is, like are you using the term that they refer to their parent as, which is completely appropriate. I, I think there's a lot of misinformation and that's making people recognize it's a sensitive topic, which is appropriate, but I think that sometimes people feel a little bit challenged how to ask. So I think when things like that come up where I think about the things that I'm doing automatically, how do I train someone to do that? That's making, that's giving me my, my medium comfort level. For you guys, like, how do you feel about your access to training? I don't think there's never not enough training. Like, we can always Good. use enough training. <laughs> okay. Um, I really liked your talk, and I think you did it. Did you recently do it during ABAI? Did you present again? I remember I during did. quarantine when we did all of these telehealth. Yes. The, <laughs> the one on race and bias. I uh, mm -hmm. forgot the title of it, but I thought that was fantastic. There was like three I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they were all great. And yeah, I was just you. like, you know, this isn't something that we talk about enough. Mm -mm. Yeah. And it's great, like you said, that it was included in the old code, but now it's updated. Yes. And it has more like inclusions in it. And, you know, just for people who are brand new to the field, just to have like these trainings and to just be just recognizing like differences and like backgrounds and like diversity it's you can never have enough training and I think it's great that you know we're getting to that level of like recognizing it more and more the other point I wanted to bring up is to remember that when we're talking about the client it's not always just the learner so I think 
with our background and our education and if we have proper experience, we work with, very, with lots of different clients. And if you work with a client long enough, you will have worked with a preschooler and then a middle schooler and then you know, a high schooler and then a young adult and then an adult. So just if time passes, that kind of one of the diverse needs of different ages, you're gonna grow up <laughs> with that client, you know what I mean? So I think disability as a diverse need. And the longer you stay in the field, you know, the more diverse the population that you're working with in terms of the disabilities that they might carry, the impact of that disability. I don't love the terms, but high function versus low function. You know, you'll just have more experience and exposure. But I want everyone to also think about the client as the family as well. I think that's when, because in my head I'm like, who's having a bias over their like client? <laughs> <laughs> but remember that that might include the family. So think about, have you worked with a very young parent before? Like, have you worked with a, a, a teen mom or a teen dad? Have you worked with older parents before who were, you know, maybe like in their mid to late 40s when they first started having children? Have you worked with a parent who had a disability themselves? Have you worked with a parent who was either transgender or cisgendered? Have you worked with a, a family whose marital or relationship status wasn't kind of what is quote unquote traditional? You know, a single parent, or maybe um, it's a multi-generational home where it's the, the grandparents, so the parents' parents, who are kind of like the, the matriarch or patriarch or the family, and they're the decision makers. Various socioeconomic status. So when you're supporting your trainees and your supervisees, focus on those areas. And it's not bad if you haven't, but how are you being culturally responsive and how are you being diverse in your treatment planning when we are working with all these different types of families?